pirates in North Carolina? Well, sure, 250 years ago, uh, Blackbeard down in Bath. Uh, but what about modern pirates working on assassinations of the U.S. presidents, all headquartered in North Carolina? Well, all that's part of a brand new book by best-selling author Steve Berry. It's called The Jefferson Key, and we'll talk to him about that book and pirates on North Carolina Book Watch next. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV, and by the North Carolina Humanities Council. <laughs> Welcome to North Carolina Book Watch. I'm D.G. Martin, and my guest is Steve Berry, the best-selling author of um, a number of books, but now uh, The Jefferson Key, largely set uh, in North Carolina with um, North Carolina people. Uh, Steve Berry, welcome. Great to be here. Well, this is a, a well, th first of all, this is just the latest in a long series of best-selling books, and you uh, call this, I guess, maybe the Cotton Malone series. We got a new book of, about Cotton Malone but it's uh, largely set in North Carolina, and you've got some very interesting North Carolina people who are major players in the book. What, uh, you know, you're a Georgian or a Floridian. What's your interest in North Carolina? I'm, I'm kind of a, partially a North Carolinian, too. I've been coming to North Carolina, they told me yesterday, since before I was born. <laughs> I, did, I didn't know that till yesterday, uh, but uh, I do remember coming here from about age five on. Uh, we would spend uh, a week or so in the summer, and then Christmas time would be. Why spending. is that? Why'd you come? To My mother was born in Wilson, and uh, so she was born and raised there. Uh, my aunts and uncles live in Greenville, uh, still now. Wow. So they they've been there. So we would come up to Wilson and Greenville. They also had a house over in Bath and in uh, Bayview, really, which is right next right, door right, to Bath. Right, right. And so we would go over to Bayview quite a bit, and we'd go into Bath and. I mean, I motored up that creek in a boat many a time in, into Bath uh, and saw all of that. So I, I've been coming here a lot, and I can still recognize the distinctive East Carolina accent that you hear when I'm out and about around. I can, uh, when I'm traveling, I can hear it occasionally. I'll say, "You're from East North Carolina, aren't you?" And I say, "Yep." Uh, you, there's a particular little. Uh, you know, something you're trained ear well, to you hear recognize. Well, you hear it, yeah. There's little, little ways certain syllables are said and all. And uh, I've been around my cousin all this week, so I've been listening to him, and I can hear it. I can hear that, 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 that East Carolina accent. So I feel like I'm part of up here. So when I was th thinking about this book, to write this American thriller, I said uh, pirates, yes. And if I'm going to have pirates, i got to have bath. Wow. Got to have bath. And so how did your idea uh, – well, first of all, for, uh, you've got a lot of fans, and I don't want to, uh, mm -hmm. you know – just reiterate what they already know, but you've got a whole series of books in which history is a very important part and mysteries in history and weaving them together. Mm -hmm. How did the idea about pirates in North Carolina uh, bloom into a book that has uh, assassinations of presidents and connective links with Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson and all sorts of other things? How did that develop out of your familiarity with North Carolina pirate it History all, and legend. It all came about because of a clause in the Constitution. It's in Article One, Section 8. And it's the power of the Congress to grant letters of mark. And I dare say that very few people in America understand that the Congress of the United States can actually hire pirates to work for the United States government. That's what letters of mark are. You basically give a grant to someone to go out and pillage and steal from our enemies, immune from prosecution. There's no, they, they call themselves a privateer when they get that letter in their hands, but there's really no difference between Well, we'll talk about the difference between uh, uh, privateer and the history of privateering and mm -hmm. pirates and the intersection of the two. Well, it's been said that privateers is the nursery of pirates, and that's exactly right. And the only difference between a privateer and a pirate is a privateer holds a letter of mark. Pirate does not. One works inside the law, which is the privateer. One works outside the law, which is the pirate. But what they do is identical. There's no difference in what they do. 
the privateers helped win the American Revolution. Uh, this is uh, something that even George Washington acknowledged. The Re American Revolution was brought to its knees and it ended when American privateers devastated English shipping. They went over, they staked themselves out outside the coast of England, and they just completely devastated shipping. Where did, I, I was interested in this. I, honestly, mm -hmm. I didn't know any until I read your book in the uh, history mm -hmm. uh, post log, I guess, mm -hmm. that explained some of the history about it, that um, the pri pri privateers were so active. So what this meant was that there were a lot of Americans who had ships that they could put in service. And where did the Americans... Uh, before the revolution get all these ships. I thought the British sort of had no, a monopoly the, on no, shipping. We had, no, we had American shipping here and American merchants here, and they were here, and there was a lot of, of, of wealthy individuals who owned ships. And the various colonies granted letters of mark. The Continental Congress did a little bit, but mainly they came from the colonies. And they would get their letter of mark and they'd head out. Now remember, a privateer doesn't get paid unless he takes something. He has to go out and find something and take it. Otherwise, he makes no money at it. So they went over, 880 ships roughly. Wow. And they staked out the English coast. And they devastated English shipping to the point that English merchants had to start shipping all of their goods with French ships, who they hated with a passion. And they, 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 they finally, the, and the economy was getting into chaos. And finally, the merchants and the bankers all went to the crown and said, you got to stop this. This has got to end. Well, this is uh, not a part of uh, high school American history. Well, it is, but I don't think they go into it in depth. This mm -hmm. is one of those aspects of history that is sort of to the side that yeah. you don't, unless you're going to read into it a little, read more you're going to learn about. I knew a little bit that privateers were involved in the American Revolution because you hear that all the time because we didn't have a navy, but I didn't realize how much they actually Almost did. Almost a thousand ships. And they and devastated English shipping. They brought it to its knees and that's what happened. They, the, the merchants raised cane and the crown said we've got to end this and they ended it and that's how the war ended. So you pick up on this little known it's obvious it's there in the Constitution and right then there. you say I, I can't remember reading about it in my history books but you say it's there but not prominently. Article uh, 1 section 8 it's been sitting there since the beginning sitting dormant for 200 years. How do you make a um, a thriller out of, out of those well, then facts? I, when I came up with that I said this is pretty cool I mean now what if these privateers were still around what if there was a group of them who were granted a letter of mark by the first Congress in gratitude for all that they did and I twisted it just a little bit. I made the letter of mark in perpetuity. Most letters of mark had a time limit on them, but I made this one in perpetuity. That would be unusual, but Very that unusual. becomes a key element. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so that uh, you have people operating under that letter? They have of their mark. letter of mark, and they have been devastating the enemies of the United States ever since that time. And then when the American intelligence community came along in the now 19th century. Let me interrupt you again, Steve. Sure. I really apologize for sure. this. No. But, um, they've been devastating. America's enemies as privateers, but um, I mean, there, there are no pirate ships out there. You don't there have to have ships. ships. Why do you need ships? You don't need ships well, anymore. Well, you gotta if you're to gonna be a if you're gonna take a ship, you gotta have no, a ship. A letter of mark doesn't necessarily mean. I understand it meant that in the late 18th century mm -hmm. that you had a ship. But all that meant is, is that you had the vehicle in which to go out and wreak havoc on our enemies. Today, the vehicle to wreak havoc on our enemies could be something as simple as a laptop computer. Ah. Uh. Uh, you don't. You just need a vehicle to wreak the havoc, and the vehicles have changed. So all I did is my my modern day privateers all through this all through the, cent the 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 decades have been working with the government. Some they would uh, like during World War One and during World War Two and during the Spanish American War. They were all involved in all of these processes, and th this is part of the fiction now that I'm in there. And this is what they were doing. Remember, a letter of mark. You you ha you can only devastate our enemies. Can't. Mess with us now. You got to do it with the enemies, so they do it. But what's happened is, is it's reached a point they've gone a little too far. So actually, when I said modern day pirates, that was technically wrong. Mm -hmm. These are uh, in your in your uh, book. These are operate. These are privateers or successor to privateers with a permission of the government. To a point. They've gone a little too far. That's what happened with every privateer. They would take their letter of mark and push it to the max. And once you cross that line, you become a pirate just like that. Just like that. So that's the problem. That's Tell us the, as much as you will about these uh, North Carolina holders of a perpetual letter of mark. Mm -hmm. who, who, they, I made up. I made them up. There are four families, but I used actual names of privateers from the time back in those days. So I, I went back and looked at a list of some of the privateers. Talk about. I tell you what. Let me get you to the mm -hmm. most prominent one is a guy named Quentin, Quentin Hale. Quentin Hale. And so, 
Tell us about Quentin Hale. But He's the most interesting character. He was a cool guy. I, I, I modeled him after some real, real privateers and all. I also modeled him after uh, his family, after the folks who actually founded Bath. And there's a tale in the book about how Bath is founded, and that's modeled after the real thing. Not the Hales, but another family. Another there. family founded them, and they went up and they, they found this little uh, cozy little uh, inlet off the Pamlico River that would be a perfect place to uh, where ships could sit and not be you know, in any harm's way, and they created Bath. And of course, Bath grew into a colonial capital, became a very uh, vibrant uh, trading post, and then became Pirate Central in about the mid 18th century. This was a place where, this was the hangout. If you were gonna find a pirate on the Eastern Seaboard, this was the go place to, to be. This was the place to and be. And in your book, go to Bath for the modern day. Today. Private to your pirate, yeah. and Quentin Hale, I, I wanna get back to him mm. because tell us, tell us who he was and what were his characteristics and why is he such an important part well, of Well, he was a, uh, he, he's a man, he's an anachronism. That's the best way to put it. He's an anachronism. He, he, he wants to live the old way, the way, the way they lived back in the 18th and 19th century. He likes that. He, he has a great affinity for that. He feels at home when he's out on his boat, which is a giant uh, sleuth that was uh, modern after, I modeled that after an actual real boat, by the way. Uh, and he, he feels alive there. And he likes that aspect that he's answerable to no one other than his fellow uh, captains and his crew. And that's so he has an organ, a pirate or a privateer organization. He has his whole organization. They put and where the, do they live? Where they, do they, live? They, they live just north of, just uh, 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 be west of Bath. In Bath, there's a little, there's a creek that comes in. Right. The town sits over on the eastern side. There's a whole spit of land up here that's mainly farmland and uh, forest. And I went all back up in that land when I was here a couple of years ago, and that's where I put them. I put well, them all up uh, there. you describe this guy nicely, but he's got a mean streak to him, doesn't he? Very much so. And uh, and but he's also feels slighted. He feels like the United States government, all that his family has done for the government through the decades, and now they want to prosecute him. They want to put him out of business. What they've done is what's happened is the IRS has come after them, and they're going they're going after him. They're going after for tax evasion, and they're going to put him in prison because the United States intelligence community has had enough of them. They went too far. These guys went too far. And what I used in the book was what happened in Dubai uh, about a, a couple of years ago when Dubai was basically going bankrupt. But what was happening is there were folks actually buying up those assets at pennies on the dollar and creating more and more havoc over there. That was really happening. And when I read about that, I said, well, that's my guys. I'll have my this guys. This is what Quentin Hale is yeah, doing. Yeah, and he says, look, I'm devastating our enemies. I'm going over there and putting them out of business. And the intelligence community says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Dubai's not our enemy. Uh, we actually have a friend over there. You don't need to be doing that. Stop. But the pirates don't. They go, they go too far. So they've still got this letter of mark, mm -hmm. which gives them the perpetual right to be active against America's enemies. But by going too far, the government says, we don't care. They could come apart. But there's one mark. teeny little problem with their letter of mark, and that's where the book becomes fun. Can you tell us, what, uh, mm. uh, the, the promotional parts of the book tell us something about that. We, tell us what you will. Well, you have to you. have congressional authorization for a letter of mark. It takes a vote of the Congress and a si signature of the President of the United States. Now, of course, they have their letter of mark signed by the President. By George Washington. By George Washington, signed by that. And, th and the problem is, what happened was that the authorization for their letters of mark have been ripped out. So the, the government journals. or someone challenging that could say George Washington did not have authority to can't issue find this. It. Can't find it. And what happened was is Andrew Jackson ripped those pages out of the journal, ripped them out, and hid them away. And that's what they're after. They've got to find those pages from those journals in order to make their letter of mark valid. Because what's happened is the presidents that they've challenged on this have said, look, you got your letter of mark, but I don't see anything in here where the Congress has approved your letter of mark. So I had to have a treasure hunt, and that's how I created the treasure well, hunt. Well, now you talk about Andrew Jackson and his part, but you named your book the Jefferson Key. And what part does uh, Thomas Jefferson the play code, in this part? The code that Jackson uses. Jackson create, hid everything away through a cipher that Thomas Jefferson considered as the perfect cipher. And it was the perfect cipher, to be honest with you, because it was never uh, deciphered until 2009. They finally figured it out. And so I what used... What is this? You know, we've read mm. Da Vinci Code, and we mm. know all... I mean, we got a little bit of a visual from the movie. Of, what is this? What is this? This cipher, cipher. This is a mathematical cipher that a friend of Jefferson's created. It's a way to hide messages inside this uh, this uh, cipher of letters. And it's in the book. I have the cipher in there, and I actually hide my own message in the cipher, so you can see just exactly how he did it. And it's very complicated. It's extremely complicated. And he's right. It is a perfect cipher. And unless you know the key, 
to the cipher. There's a mathematical key, and if you don't have that key, you can't unlock well, it. Well, now with modern day computers that can take you know thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of different mm -hmm. uh, options, you can't break a code. They did it. That's how they did it. It took a sophisticated program in 2009 and they did it. It took them three weeks to run this wow. program and they broke it and they found the key. They actually found the key. And so I used that key and that's where it comes from, the Jefferson key. So Andrew Jackson, this rough, rough and ready military man from North Carolina and Tennessee, uh, somewhere along the line got to be sophisticated enough to develop this no, idea about the code? It's even more interesting than that. This is true. The man who gave Jefferson the cipher was a man named Robert Patterson, and he gave it to him. Robert Patterson's son worked for Andrew Jackson. This is true. And when I discovered that connection, I went, this is too good. I've got to use that. So that's where it came from. And so Jackson, who's very angry at the Commonwealth, who are my, 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 my pirates. The Commonwealth is the name of this group of, of pirates, families who've yeah. got the right. legal right, the mark, the right. legal right. They tried to, to kill Jackson. And he's now, the, uh, now, these are people who are, they've got a license to, uh, to attack the enemies of the United States, but they don't have a license to attack uh, the president, Not but they all. do. What, what? What? How does? How do you there explain were, that? What, well, what? I, that's how I tie in presidential assassinations. There's four presidential assassinations that happened in this country, and I tied them all in for the same reason. In other words, these presidents were killed for the same reason, and I was able to, and he, and able to link them up with my Commonwealth. Now that's part of the fiction of the book, but it was pretty fun to do because it fit very nicely. It all fit in there pretty, very nice. And I just hypothesized that there were four presidents along the way that just wouldn't play ball. They just wouldn't play ball. And when they wouldn't play ball, the Commonwealth did what pirates do. <laughs> That's what pirates do. And they took care of that. Now, no one knows that but the members of the Commonwealth. They kept that pretty tight. Uh, but Jackson wouldn't play ball either. They went after Jackson, but they failed. They, they, there was an attempt on Andrew Jackson's life in 1835. It was the first time a president had ever been threatened with his life. And it failed. And so I used that, and I opened the book with that. And that's what got Jackson very angry with these guys. And then he ripped the pages ripped out, them out, which and is he, and 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 he, this is a, was an interesting part. And I wonder what basis you had to um, make Jackson someone who is a, who would tease in this sense of establishing a mystery that would drive his enemies crazy. What he but, said. What he said is, is uh, he has a note that he writes to them, and what he says in the note is. Look, I ought to just tear these up and throw them away. But if I do that, what will happen is you'll have no reason not to come and kill me or any other president to do. So I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a shot at it. So it will occupy your time. And you can go look for this. And this will give you something to go look for. Now, he was very confident that it would never be found because of the perfect cipher that Thomas Jefferson had. So he was very confident. And he was right. They never found it. They didn't find it until now, so that's how I explained it. That's great. Yeah, I want I, I, I do want to talk about your characters, and I haven't, I haven't really pushed you to talk about the pirate, the privateer, Quentin Hale, enough. And I'd like for you to uh, illustrate for us, as you do in the book, uh, his pirate personality when it came to punishing people who oh, betrayed wow. him. Oh yes, and those are all real. I have a. What do you mean? Those are real tortures from, from old days. From the old days, yes. But there's this some, is a guy doing it in the modern time. Yeah, it, there's a traitor in the. There's a scene in the traitor in the book, and they they uh, they have to set an example. Uh, people who violate the all pirates work, work by articles. You signed your articles. Articles with the rules whereby the pirate community governed themselves. When you broke the articles, you paid the price. Someone in here does it, and they and they punish him by something called woodling. Woodling was very awful. I, I don't. I, I hesitate to have you describe woodling, but can you do this in a way that's <laughs> to do acceptable for family television? Two sticks with uh, a rope tied between the sticks. You put it between the head, and you start twisting the sticks until finally, you know, it twists up to it touches your head. Then they start turning, and they start turning. And as they turn, the rope gets tighter and tighter and tighter. The pressure builds in your skull. Now it won't kill you, but what it'll do, it literally pops your eyeballs out. Your eyeballs literally come out of their sockets if you get enough pressure in so there. So it's just plain out torture. It's plain out, just flat out torture. So and torture. that's how they did it. That was exactly what they did. The gibbet is real. It's an iron cage that was used. Now that was used on the pirates themselves. That was sort of a reverse one that was used on them. So that was real. What is the you want to the gibbet is an iron? It's an iron cage made to fit your body, and uh, you would basically be hung from that, and you'd be hung up until you starve and die, wow. and you just rot inside the gibbet. And then we did the thing of um, 
The last one was the one that we did was the kenling, which was kind of interesting. That one's that was the most bizarre one to me, in which they had the mass, the center mass, and they would put candles around the mast, and then the uh, prisoner would have to circle the mast, and everyone standing around with something in their hands to whack him with. And they just keep whacking him with that as he goes around and around and around. Not hard, just enough. And after a while, it literally just beats them down because they get wore out because they have to keep moving because they're constantly getting hit. And the candle creates heat. It's a really, I mean, they were very imaginative in what they did. Quentin Hale, this, uh, the, the lead bad guy, I guess, in the book, um, in many ways is just like one of our colleagues um, who can make his way in in society, mm -hmm. can sell, can charm, yep. but he has this uh, pirate yes. instinct that allows him to It's in his blood, and, and I wanted to do that. I wanted to create this guy, and I made him like they used to be, but he also has to function in today's society, and so he's, he's very much, though, out of place, and you're seeing the end, eventually it catches up to him. Well, your fans are, are going to be angry with me for spending so much time on Quentin Hale when they really want to hear about Cotton, Cotton Malone. Malone, and Cotton mm -hmm. Malone is um, a character from a series of books and you bring him to North Carolina uh, or to bring him in confrontation with North Carolina people. Tell us just a little bit about Cotton Malone for those who haven't gotten to know him yet. He's a retired Justice Department agent. He lives in Copenhagen and he runs an old bookshop there. And he was created in Copenhagen. I was in Copenhagen and that's where he was born. And uh, Cotton's a very interesting guy. He's, uh, he's a lot like me. Uh, when I created him, I was hoping I was going to get to keep him around. You don't know when you create a character whether you're going to get to do him again. So I just modeled him after me in a lot of respects. And so uh, there's a lot of me in Cotton Malone. Um, he's changed a lot since the Templar legacy. He's a little different character now. He's a little more introspective, a little more emotional, a little more uh, conscious of what he's doing. Um, he's not a swashbuckling guy now. Cotton makes mistakes. Cotton screws up. He overestimates. He underestimates. He's, he's flawed. He has to work for a living. He has to earn a paycheck. He's got an ex-wife. He's got a son that he has a troubled relationship with. So he has problems that we all can relate to. And that's where I think he's caught on a little bit because he's very much like all of us. But it, like us, but in many respects so much beyond us in terms of his uh, superhuman energy, willingness to accept danger, and uh, intense competitive instinct when it comes to dealing with the bad He can guys. rise to extraordinary things when necessary, and that's the cool thing about him. When he's, when he's cornered and when he's pushed, he can do extraordinary things, and that's what I like about him. And, and of course, you have to have that element in a protagonist in a, in a series like this. There are uh, seven or eight or nine or ten other very interesting characters in this book, several of which, in fact, the majority of which have been uh, characters in your earlier books. Mm -hmm. And so here, this, is, this gets back to the writing challenge that you ha have as an author when you're dealing with someone who picks up this book as their first mm -hmm. book, never heard of Cotton Malone before, and yet uh, a whole bunch of other people are picking it up and, and know Cotton Malone and they're ready to get on with his adventures. What, how do you deal with the challenge of uh, getting something satisfactory for both sets of readers. It's very hard. <laughs> That's a really tough when you write a series. A series has to be the same but different. Every book has to be the same but different, and that's really tough to do, and I've had to work at that. You can't write the books where someone picks one up and is utterly lost. They have to be able to pick it up and get right in and go, but you don't want to write it in such a way that your returning readers say, well, I don't feel like I'm where I need to be. So I have to give just enough of the little reminders from the, from the big other books, but not enough to make the new reader feel lost. How do you, do you just do this instinctively or do you have little ways to discipline yourself that says, remember, you know, a little thing up on the wall that says, remember to give a little background No, I, I have it in my brain. I say, I say every once in a while, I only do it two or three times in a book. I'm very care careful about it. I used to do it more in the beginning, and then I, we realized that it's probably better not to do it as much. It's probably just two or three times. And they're very fleeting, by the way. You want your reference to the backstory to be in such a way that a returning reader goes, yeah, I got it. Don't but have to, I can, skip, I can read this real it, quick, I knew it. that. But the new reader go, it doesn't bother them. It doesn't bother yeah. them. They don't feel like, you know, it's kind of like if me and you were whispering, and some people were sitting over there, and they were saying, what are they talking about? It'd drive them crazy. 
You don't want that. You don't want to be like a little whisper right. going on there that drives them crazy. So I have to be very careful, and I practice doing that. It's just something you have to work at. I, I can imagine that it's a great challenge, and I, I wonder if you're going to face that challenge again with the new book. You say you're you're writing books all the time. What After, you got, what you, tell us about what you got going and what we can look for. Well, Cotton's going to take a vacation next year. He's uh, He called me on the phone. He was very upset. I've been blowing up his bookshop and causing him a lot of problems, a lot of, a lot of trouble. He said, could I just have a year off? He wants so to. you're going to let him rest He's going to rest for one year, and oh, I'm going to write a stand standalone next year of a new set of characters. Uh, history secrets, action, adventure, that kind of thing. It's Can all going to be Can you give us there. the basic history? I wish I could, but it, uh, my publisher would kill me if I did. <laughs> I did. But it deals with something from history that no one's really dealt with in fiction before. It's really kind of neat. It's an interesting aspect of history. We just got back from Prague. We did some research there, and we were in Jamaica earlier this year. We did some research there. They're going to take place in those two areas. Well, we will so, uh, look forward to that. It's a good a, story. A lot, of, uh, a lot of enthusiasm because what you've done in bringing history alive mm -hmm. and challenging us to now sort out what's real and what's not real has been lots of fun Thanks. and a real, uh, real page turner. Thanks for coming back oh, to this, North Carolina. This is great. It's great to be here. And thanks to all y'all for listening. Our guest has been Steve Berry. He's the author of The Jefferson Key. And if you'll come right back here next week, same time, I'll introduce you to another one of North Carolina's great authors. See you then. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV, and by the North Carolina Humanities Council.